Honorable Minister, members of the diplomatic corps, friends all, I'm welcoming you today to the celebrating the wonders of cassava. As a young boy, I first learned of cassava when I saw my grandparents boiling it to make a starch. And then later on, the little ladies selling some cakes on the roadside, I learned they came from cassava. But in general, it was poor man's food. And now it is reaching the tables, the gourmet tables across the world. As my mentor would say, you know, Minister Rex Netreford, you'd say, what a caca. <laughs> this is something of tremendous interest and opportunity. I would really want to take this opportunity and say how pleased we are that UTEC is anchoring this. We're looking at the engineering of the ways in which this foodstuff can be made available. We speak of it as a major starch and it is feeding over half a billion people and I think that is large and just in the South America and the Southern areas of North America. When you pull the African continent, it's largely a South-South kind of food. When you pull the African continent in, I suspect that we must be well near to a billion because cassava is one of the staples. In my other hat that I wear, I would like to put a challenge out for them, for those of you, you know, promoting cassava as a food to invite me to speak on the biochemical aspects of it. Because it is not by chance, you know, Minister, that Bami and Fish is a well-accepted meal. And the Amazonian Indians had discovered it long ago that fish and Bami is a real nutritious meal which gives you all the balance that you need. But now, the book that we will be seeing today, I see all kinds of wonders in the way in which cassava can be, can be had. And uh, I trust that what we're doing here today and what we're opening this morning will be the start of much things. Your predecessor, the minister, had asked us to grow cassava. I don't know how many attempted it because it seems as if the whole demand just wasn't there. But with this new thrust again, and also our chairman welcomed the rain, cassava doesn't need it to grow. <laughs> it's one of those things that will grow in the dry weather. So it's really hardy. And you know, minister, after you boil it, you know that, especially the bitter one, the fiber, we can use it to make some rope, you know, which we can hang ourselves with. <laughs> but, but, Anyway, uh, let me welcome everyone, and this cassava thrust is of potential, you know, uh, import to the country, and we see our Minister of Agriculture is here, and clearly he has some ideas that he would like to posit with us. We have already been working with the Minister on a number of other initiatives. Uh, which he might mention this morning, but we just want to say that we're a committed minister to working with the developmental trust in the way in which the government sees its whole uh, direction in income generation and in terms of jobs opportunity. You take is there step by step with you. That way. I'm very happy to be here this morning to share in this celebration of cassava. And let me congratulate the organizers and welcome the effort and collaboration between CARDI and UTEC 
and all the players who have put this festival and symposium together to demonstrate our commitment to advancing our economy through the production of local foods. Let me thank and congratulate McNeish, lecturer and author for the publication of the recipe being launched today. And I will not leave without mine. I hear it's 3,000, yes. but mine is free. Yes. <laughs> thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a long while back that we've been talking about cassava. In the 70s, there was a massive drive about cassava production. There was even a processing facility that was put up in St. Elizabeth at Goshen. It ended somewhat in disarray because the facility was virtually too big for the production that was around. So there was not the throughput to have that facility going. It was intended then that starch would be made to supply the um, Alpard plant and other bauxite plants. It fell off. Then um, a couple of years ago, my predecessor launched another big drive on cassava. It also did not come to anything significant because, for one thing, we took him for joke in Parliament, you know, and <laughs> it became a political football, as it were. Oh, this man is just saying plant cassava. It did not have the underpinnings of a proper marketing arrangement and other things, and therefore it also fell through. Today we are making a fresh start, as it were. And what is important is that you are starting from the end. I've always said that one of the difficulties we face in introducing local foods to our people is the way it's presented. And looking through your book, glancing through it, it makes it so attractive to have cassava. And therefore, I am fully on board this time and we're going to be working might and main with you. And anybody who comes to criticize, we will fight them to the ground because we're going to be producing cassava. <laughs> we have spoken consistently about eating what we grow and growing what we eat. And that again has been the adage for 30, 40 years. But we have been saying it, but we have not been doing it in any significant way. But you know, 2008, it came home vividly to us, the importance of food security and working towards feeding ourselves in, a best, in as best a way as we can. And you know, in 2008, when the crisis began, when food prices went through the roof, there were even shortages. People were saying, oh my God, look at all the land out here and we're not producing. And then afterwards, things abated. Prices trended back down. And then we just relaxed ourselves into that false sense of security. And therefore it is my task to make the Jamaican people aware once more that we will not put ourselves back in that false sense of security. We have put on the table, and it's in a white paper now, at Parliament, our food and nutrition policy. And Parliament will deal with it. Cabinet has signed off on it. People are even talking about 
my suggesting breastfeeding and all that. Um, it's a joint document between the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Agriculture. We have no problem with breastfeeding, we encourage that. But that was not the main gist of what agriculture is about. Agriculture is about feeding the mother to be able to breastfeed the child. So we are onto that. And therefore, the policy is <laughs> for our people to have access to affordable and nutritious foods. Cassava is just one of them. And the versatility of cassava is there for everyone to see. I had a loaf of bread coming out of Trinidad, which had 30% cassava in it. I asked them for more. I took it to cabinet and we sliced it up. And you know, my cabinet colleagues ate. And you know, when I finished, I told them, you know, you had um, bread which had 30% cassava and they didn't realize that that could be so. When you go to South America, Latin America, you go to cocktails and you would see powders, cassava with garlic butter and all that. You eat and lick your finger. But when you come back to Jamaica, you don't want to eat it. <laughs> because it is abroad. And that is one of the things I've always been saying. We have this pension for wanting to consume things which come from abroad. We must make sure that we grow what we eat and eat what we grow to the max. Rice, yes. But the studies show that cassava is much more nutritious than rice. That is what is said. I don't eat rice. I love sweet cassava. They have a slim one in the country. What's the name? You guys don't know it? It's a sweet cassava. Huh? No, oh, let me find the country name. <laughs> Anybody? I can't remember myself, but... Rockwood. Oh my God, that's a wonderful. You have never had Rockwood sweet cassava? Yeah, man, when you have that, you don't want anything else to eat. Lovely. So we are going to make sure that we put into production much of that as we seek to deal with our food security. Another opportunity now arises. Red Stripe says they want cassava to substitute for the ops that they put in their beers. So we soon will be drinking cassava. <laughs> Contrary to the view, and it came out from somewhere else, that cassava will slow poison you over time. Well, if it were so, many of us would have died a long time ago. And I'm not a youth. And I've been eating cassava all my life. Whether in that form or in Bami form. So we're going to be working with Red Stripe. We're trying to work out the pricing arrangement to enable us to get our farmers into production. What are we doing in this trust for food security? The government has targeted some idle acreages and we have dubbed them agroparks. And those agroparks are intended 
to the parts where we produce to fit the whole value chain. Marketing is going to be an important aspect of that production. Extension, best practices will be the order of the day because we want to use those as examples as to how we produce. Because we cannot continue to say we can't compete. We don't have the economies of scale so we can't compete. Well, we better compete. Because if we don't decide to feed ourselves, other people are planning to feed us. And they will send in cheap food, yes, and destroy your own productive base because they have the capacity so to do. And after they find that they have destroyed your own agricultural base, they up the price and make back the money that they have lost quickly. By the time you try to get back into production, they have made a killing. And then when they see you start to produce again, they lower the price. And then you say, oh my God, we can get cheaper things from abroad. There was a time when it was said that it was cheaper to import rice. There was a time when it was said it was cheaper to bring in milk powder. Today, there is no cheap milk powder. And our dairy farmers are there suffering. We're going to up the ante with them and we're going to help them to move the production up again. And sometimes, we as a country, we must be prepared to pay even a little more for the local produce. Because in essence, sometimes, what we believe is cheap food is really cheap food. But our production. We are number one. Some of the things which come into the country, probably grade five, they have taken out their grade ones and their grade twos and so forth. And what is left, they pack it up and send for us poor third world countries and we run it down. So today we come to celebrate in no small fashion a new thrust into the growth and development of this cassava. I want to commit Radha and the Ministry of Agriculture to do whatever we can in making that move go forward with dispatch. I'm happy to know, as I said before, that UTEC is involved. In my sectoral presentation, I made the point that because of our limit of our limited scope as far as research goes in our own little confine at the Ministry of Agriculture, we needed to make some very, very serious linkages with our universities here as a first step. Because we don't have to rediscover the wheel. Put your expertise that you have, your capacity that you have, UE, Northern University, CASE, SRC, with our research at the Ministry of Agriculture, we can move mountains. And then when we do that, we also make other linkages with other universities abroad. It is interesting to note that within the three weeks that I said so in Parliament, we have had some wonderful contacts. Florida A&M University has come. And within a couple of weeks, we are going to be putting together a memorandum of understanding as to how we can work together for developing aspects of the agricultural sector. Hold on. <laughs> Just last week, I got my visit from UTEC. Yes. And we are working to develop what we call, right now, 
herbarium. Herbaria is more than one. Good. So, about three herbaria. And we want to exploit to the max all those herbs and especially those indigenous herbs that we have in Jamaica. We want to exploit it to the max. And so, I've tasked my ministry to get somebody on board to work as a coordinator, especially in that herbal situation. Everybody is telling me about Trangbak, Sassi Perilla, this, that, and the other. I got a joke that this man had an extra dose of Strangbak, you know, ready to work. But he ended up in the bathroom. And the lady was there waiting because they didn't know how much to use. You know, you have to have a way, <laughs> have to find a way to deal with it. You know, you know what I mean? So we must bring a scientific approach to the whole process. You know, you can't just go drink what you want to drink. And therefore, we're working with the universities. And we want also a guy like Henry Lowe to be on board. And we want to make one massive coming together to make us into one great nation. I feel very nostalgic about what is happening here this morning. And I'm happy that you invited me. Um, Prof, let me congratulate you, Tech, for the great work that you are doing. And you have been moving by leaps and bounds. As a matter of fact, it seems as though you have to be running down the momentum now. It's moving even faster than you would have anticipated. So ladies and gentlemen, I come to endorse the efforts and pledge the support of the Ministry of Agriculture in every aspect that you need to move this thing forward. Cardi, um, EU, FAO, ECA, all hands on board. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I close by saying, if we hold on together, I know our dreams will never die. <laughs> Today, Jerome Thomas. From <laughs> and to our president, Professor Leonard Errol Morris. Representatives from. Yeah, 